So our goal is to be able to find the limit of a function using an algebra equation. And the simplest functions we are going to look at are polynomials, which are made of even simpler functions. So what we're going to do is break down polynomials into their tiniest parts and then look at all the pieces and then put that all together. So the simplest functions are horizontal lines. So if you just draw a graph grid and you draw a horizontal line like y equals 2, well, if you think about our whole limit idea, we were saying, well, what value is y approaching as x gets to some certain value? Well, in this case, y is never changing. So if you have the limit as x goes to any number, so say 2, or let's use a different number so it's not confusing. As x goes to 4, where this is the y value, y equals 2, well, it's always going to be equals 2. So whenever they use the same letter in two places in a math sentence, it means it's representing the same value. So for this graph, we'd have the limit as x goes to negative 7 of 2 is 2. No matter what your x value is going to, the limit is the y value. Okay, so that's not very exciting. The next simplest functions are diagonal lines. And a diagonal line has the equation y equals x. So it's a line with a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of 0. So that's the diagonal line. Well, for every point on this line, if x is 2, then y is 2. If x is negative 4, then y is negative 4. So no matter what value x is approaching, the limit is the number it's approaching. So see how the a is the same number in both places here. So that implies that the same value goes in both of those places. So the limit as x goes to negative 4 of x is negative 4. So make sure you notice the difference between this first case and this second case. Okay, so then polynomial functions have x to powers and then coefficients in front. So you've seen lots of polynomials probably. If you have 2x cubed minus 5x plus 7, that's a polynomial. The numbers multiplying in the front are coefficients, so the 2 and the negative 5. The 7 is called the constant. And in this generic polynomial here, it's the a sub 0. And then the 2x cubed is a term. Negative 5x is a term. And 7 is both a constant and a term. It's the constant term. Okay, so the nice thing about polynomials is that when you draw their graphs, they're continuous and smooth. They don't have any bumps or jumps or corners or nothing strange about them. They're very nicely behaved functions. So if you can recognize a polynomial, so here's a polynomial, if you recognize a polynomial, in order to find its limit, the limit always exists, and you can find it by just plugging in the value that x is approaching. So the limit as x goes to 2 of this polynomial is 3 times 2 cubed minus 4 times 2 squared minus 5 times 2 plus 2. So I'm going to have 24 minus 16 minus 10 plus 2. Oh, it looks like 0. So in this particular graph, it must be the case that as x approaches 2, y approaches 0. And in fact, f of 2 equals 0. And the point 2, 0 is on the graph. So I'm just reminding you that 
if you know this one piece of information about the limit of the polynomial, you also know the value of the function, and you also know a point on the graph. Okay, so let's do one more example where I just plug in negative 1 everywhere I see an x. And be super careful with your negative signs. and I'm getting 4. So f of negative 1 is 4, and the point negative 1, 4 is on the graph. Okay, so the fancy way of saying this in math language is that if your function is a polynomial, and you want to know what the limit is as x approaches a, that you just plug a into the polynomial, and whatever you get, that's your limit. So this also works for radicals as long as the x you're approaching is in the domain. So that's why we talked a little bit about domain of functions with square roots. You got to make sure that it's a positive number inside the square root, or you need to say the function is not defined there. So we have one more important type of function that comes up in several different scenarios that we'll look at, and it's called the rational function. So see the word ratio is embedded inside the word rational. So we're going to go back to section 3.6 to refresh our memory about a rational function and, and what's special about them. So that starts on page 167 if you want to go look in the book for a more thorough treatment. So a rational function is the quotient or ratio of two polynomials. So I can have the function r of x is 2x cubed minus 5x plus 6 over 4x squared plus 7. And that's a rational function because the function in the top is a polynomial, the one in the bottom is a polynomial, and if I put one over the other, now it's called a rational function. So it is critical that we restrict the domain to only values of x that won't cause the denominator to be zero. So we already talked about beware, beware, don't let the denominator ever get to zero. So let's look, um, let me make up another example for if I have some function p of x and it has some nice polynomial in the numerator. And then in the denominator, I have x minus 3 times x plus 2. Well, I need to make sure my denominator is never going to become 0. So I would say x minus 3 can't be 0, and x plus 2 can't be 0. So that tells me that my domain is x can't be 3 or negative 2. So that's my domain. So anything else besides those two numbers is fine. And you only have to worry about the denominator. It's fine if the numerator is 0. That just makes the whole thing 0. And then we'll talk in a little bit about the special case of what if it's 0 in the numerator and the denominator. Okay, when we graph rational functions, they often have vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So vertical asymptotes are vertical lines that the graph does not cross. And any value of x that would make the denominator 0, as long as it doesn't also make the numerator 0, creates a vertical asymptote in the graph. So the graph on the left is a graph of this function f of x. And then on the right, I just added the vertical line x equals negative 5. And that's the equation of the vertical asymptote. It's the x value that would make the denominator 0. x equal to that is the equation of the vertical asymptote. 
Okay, now here's a little bit different example. Let me let me copy this one here just so we have it nearby to look at. Okay, so this is the previous example. So now I've changed it by incorporating an additional factor of x plus 5 in the numerator. Well, what that causes is the holes that we were looking at in those examples in the first part of this section. When you have a matching factor in the numerator and the denominator, that causes the hole in the graph. So these don't come up often, but we need to know how to deal with them because they do sometimes come up. Okay, so then let's talk about horizontal asymptotes. And horizontal asymptotes, we're talking about what happens if, as you go way, way out to what we call the tails of the graph, and sometimes a graph will approach some horizontal line closer and closer and closer. If it does, then that's a horizontal asymptote. So the thing that tells us about that behavior is the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator. So let's refresh our memory of what is degree, and it's the highest exponent you see on the variable. So if you have some function that looks like 2x cubed minus 5x, the degree is 3 because that's the highest exponent I see. So there are three cases. Because we're looking at rational functions where we have a polynomial in the numerator and the polynomial in the denominator, there's three possibilities. The degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. So that could be something like 2x cubed minus 5 over 3x squared plus 7. And you see the degree of the numerator is 3. The degree of the denominator is 2. And the result is that there is no horizontal asymptote. So we'd say the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x does not exist. It doesn't have a limit. It's limitless. I loved that show. Okay, so that's degree of the top bigger. So then we could have the degree of the numerator less than the degree of the denominator. So we could have, we could just turn that same function upside down. And now I have the degree of the numerator smaller than the degree of the denominator. And then what happens is you get the horizontal asymptote is the x-axis. Its equation is y equals 0. So you'd have the limit as x goes to infinity now, not a number, of g of x is 0. Because that's the y value. As this function goes further and further out towards infinity, it's either coming up to y equals 0 or down to y equals 0. Okay, then the third possibility is what if the degrees are equal? So let's see, what if we have 2x cubed plus 5 over 3x cubed minus 7? Well, if the degrees match, this is a very special case, and then the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the leading coefficients. So for this example, the line y equals 2 thirds is the horizontal asymptote. So using limit notation, we'd say the limit as x goes to infinity of h of x is 2 thirds. Okay, then let's go back to our example with the whole and talk a little bit more about that. If there are matching factors in the numerator and the denominator, like in the example we were looking at, the good news is you can cancel those matching factors when you're finding limits. 
and then you just find the limit of what's left. So in this example, it's all nicely factored out for you already. So you can see that you have matching factors of x plus 4 squared and x plus 4 squared. So that is going to equal the limit as x goes to negative 4 of what's left, x minus 5 over x minus 4. Now once you plug in the negative 4, then you no longer need the LIM notation. Okay? As soon as all you have is numbers, then you don't have LIM anymore. If you still have x's, you still need LIM. So we're going to plug in negative 4 everywhere we see an x. So we'll have negative 4 minus 5 over negative 4 minus 4. So we'll have negative 9 over negative 8, which we should never leave. And instead we'll have 9 eighths. So as x heads to negative 4 on this function, the limit is 9 eighths. So in this example, the numerator and denominator were already factored for you. That's not always going to be the case. So we're going to do a quick review of factoring, and you're going to do as much factoring review as you need in section 1.3. And that's the end of this section of the video, and we'll have another segment to continue on.